do. Kathleen? Yes, well, welcome everybody to the Lee Women Voters uh, usual Thursday, Thursday monthly meeting for us and the general public. And this one is going to be about water conservation particularly because the, the league is, is interested in environmental issues and <clears throat> spends time uh, investigating those issues and sometimes lobbying for them. We are 103 years old. We don't look like it, but we are. <laughs> we are a political organization, but we are nonpartisan <clears throat> and we include both men and women. We particularly emphasize civic engagement. And that is what we want people to do, especially around voting and, and voting information. But also we try to uh, influence public policy through education and advocacy, and sometimes work uh, to influence public policy. But we only do that when we have studied an issue pretty thoroughly. So um, with that, um, we encourage anyone who is not a member it, to investigate us at League of Women Voters of Greeley Weld County uh, using Google. And you can find our website and you can see our calendar and what kinds of things we are doing. I would like to introduce Julie Witto now, and she is going to tell us about the program and our speaker. Yes, uh, we're very, very delighted to have Ruth Quaid with us this evening. Uh, Ruth has been with the City of Greeley Water Department for I don't know how long, but she's the expert. She knows so much about this. <clears throat> and Ruth has actually built the conservation program. And I think that what she has, the information she has for us tonight, even if you perhaps don't live in Greeley, you can do some of these things and learn something that would even help you in your own backyards as well and front yards. So it is my pleasure, my great pleasure to introduce Ruth Quaid. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and get started. So first of all, tonight, um, I'm gonna give you a little background on the water department just because um, I feel like even with um, doing conservation, the more I can tell people about the water and what they can appreciate about the foresight that our ancestors had, um, I feel like that you know helps make people appreciate water and maybe be more conserving. So can you see the screen okay now? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. So I'm going to give you a quick um, overview. First of all, um, we have this four point plan in place. So it Im involves, ex yeah, I'm not getting tongue tied, expanding and improving storage, strengthening infrastructure. I'm sure you've all heard about across the United States how um, infrastructure for public works and water utilities are um, old. You know, they've been in the ground a long time. So we're strengthening infrastructure, continue, continuing to buy water, so acquire water, and then improving conservation and expanding our non-potable system. So those are kind of the four point plan that we focus on. Um, and I'm sure many of you know this history piece, but Greeley was um, founded as a union colony. It was largely agrarian. It was to be a utopian community and founded on also religion and kind of a temperance and religion type um, community. So people came here. We were settled in between the Platte and the Poudre River. So the ground is very fertile and agriculture was um, early on was wheat and other dry land plantings, but they quickly realized both for the people that lived in the city and the people that lived on the farms that the water in the Poudre and the Platte was strictly limited to the runoff season. So June, July, maybe August. And that was fine for wheat, but couldn't get um, 
potatoes and sugar beets and those root vegetables, it was harder to sustain the water and, and grow those kinds of crops. So they started building a series of canals and bringing the water from between the two rivers um, with canals to the farms. And then as far as the city's concerned, we were taking water from infiltration wells. Island Grove Park, there was a, a treatment plant there. It was pretty basic, but the water was coming from infiltration wells right along the pooter there. And again, limited to the rainy, or not the rainy season, there is no rainy season really, but limited to, you know, spring and early summer. And also they found that the water quality wasn't that good. It was very hard. So that's when they decided to go up above um, Bellevue and build a slow sand filter, take the water at the mouth of the pooter. Um, kind of covered this with the ditch companies. So they went up above Fort Collins, built the plant at, um, in Bellevue, and then they built these wooden stave pipes 36 miles to bring that water from Bellevue to Greeley, across the prairie, all hand dug or oxen dug, some horses, but mostly oxen dug. And then um, you can see the pipe here in the ground and it's basically like a whiskey barrel and they hold it together with metal, which is great when it's full of water and the wood swells and presses against those bands but they quickly realized, um, you know, in about the 30s and 40s that that wooden pipe in the ground was starting to degrade. Um, I'm gonna skip over this one. So our, what are our water resources? So I'm sure many of you know that the basis of Colorado water law was developed right here when farmers in Greeley went to water their crops pulled the little dam out so that they could, you know, flood their field or whatever. And one day the water wasn't there. So they went up to Fort Collins to see, you know, followed the river back up to see what was going on. And they found that people up above them were taking water out. So that was really the beginning of water law in Colorado. So the person who was there first has the right, they have to put it to beneficial use. And then, um, People that have those early, older share, oh, you know, older water rights, they get their water before the junior rights get it. That's they're called senior and junior rights. It's a very complicated system. We have thousands of water attorneys in Colorado, more so than all of the rest of the country combined. But we do have a complicated water law system, and. Um, if anybody's really interested in that, I can get you some resources, but you know, it's too much to go into here. I do have a fun little game we could play though. Um, so this is where we get our water from the Cashel Pooter. And we also take water from the Laramie River, which starts in Colorado, goes into Wyoming, and then comes back into Colorado. And we take that through the Cashel Pooter. And then I know you've all heard of the Colorado Big Thompson Project. So we take water from the other side of the Western Slope, the Colorado River through a Trans Mountain Diversion, bring it over to um, Carter Lake and the Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District. They are the folks that manage that. And then Greeley is a shareholder in that system. So we have shares in all of these river basins. And then here's just a map just to give you, orient you. Um, you can see, I don't know if you could see my cursor, but up here is the Colorado. This little dotted line is the Continental Divide. So it comes through a tunnel that's nine miles long from uh, Lake Granby over to Mary's Lake in Estes Park, and then comes through a series of infrastructure to the Big Thompson River. We treat it here at our Boyd Lake treatment plant we can also take it over to the Poudre River side through like Horse Tooth and the um, Pleasant Valley Pipeline. So here's the Cashlip Poudre here, and then the Laramie River Tunnel dumps into the Poudre up here. Um, our Bellevue treatment hit is here. This is the one that's been here since the early 1900s, and it's all gravity fed 
from Bellevue to Greeley, which is really great. Um, there's no pumping involved. Then in about the mid 60s, we built this Boyd Lake treatment plant here, which is just on the south end of Boyd Lake. And um, that's kind of our um, peaking plant. So Bellevue runs 365 days a year, and then Boyd comes online about mid-April, and then we shut it off mid to late October. So that one comes online just to handle summer watering, basically. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little more about the water quality over there. These are, this is one of the ditch systems. We have the number three here in town, which is the one that kind of goes diagonally from the Northwest to the Southeast. And then the Greeley Love Lanier Mission Company runs along Highway 34, crosses over 65th Avenue. Um, and then other smaller um, irrigation companies that we belong to. And that's, I'm gonna talk about non-potable in a minute, but that's how we do the non-potable system. Let's bring it through there. Um, we have priority dates on those, just like we do on the rivers. And I'm not gonna go into this too much, um, but so we own shares in it. So we can make a call on the river, just like farmers can. And then ditch company operates the ditch. They have a board of directors, and then they have a ditch rider who kind of maintains the ditch. So demand management is basically what conservation is. We do that through both the non-potable system. The more parks and HOAs we can get on non-potable water means less demand on our treated water. And it's cheaper because we don't have to treat it and pump it to get it here. Um, I mentioned our Bellevue, our Boyd Lake treatment plant. That plant, we have to pump the water to get it to Greeley. So if we can relieve some of that <clears throat> expense and energy cost by using non-potable, that's a great way to, you know, save some water and save some money for the customer. So I've listed a bunch of conservation um, measures there, and I'm going to go through a few of them in the next slides. Back to non-potable, I'm gonna skip over that. Um, okay, so many of you know, in 2013, we started doing an informational water budget and it went live on the bills with um, a rate um, attached to it in 2017. And it's an indoor and an outdoor allotment. Let me go back, sorry. Um, so the indoor is based on the number of people per household. We have an average density of 3.49, so we put three in. And then people can change that. If they have five, they're gonna get a bigger allotment because it's the uh, 45 gallons per person per day. And then times the number of days in the billing period, the outdoor allotment is based on the square footage of their property minus houses, um, sidewalks, anything that's impervious. So it's anything that could be irrigated is included in that. And then we use real-time weather to calculate the water budget. So it's kind of a tiered rate like a lot of other cities have, but it's an individualized tiers, tiered rate based on your family and your property. And we felt like this was the best way to um, incentivize conservation, but then also penalize waste and keep it fair so that all the homeowners are treated fairly. So along with the work that we implemented this, implemented this water smart customer portal. And it's a really great tool if you are on it. Um, it'll show you your water use. So you can see here, this person's water use is this tall peak here. The blue is their, um, or the gray is their water budget and then the blue is like um, normal usage. So people can go in and look and see how they compare. Why did I get this big bill? Oh, I see I'm over my water budget because then it sends them into a higher priced tier. Um, the portal also, you can get copies of bills in there. So people will call all the time and say, or even real estate folks, can I get a copy of a bill from this property or whatever so that they know how much they're gonna cost and they can estimate for homeowners. Um, the homeowners may have just lost theirs or they need to 
go back in and look at them so they can budget for it. So it's great because you can go in and look at your old bills, which you can't always do on our current website. Um, you can set up for leak alerts, and leak detection. So it'll alert you if you go in and create an account and you put in your email or if you want to, would rather get a text message, it'll send you an alert. Hey, you've got a, a leak today or you've got a leak that just started. And that's a really great tool because in the past, you didn't know you had a leak till you got the bill. And that could be, you know, we bill monthly. So that could be four to six to seven weeks, depending on um, when you get your bill and open it. And so your faucet could have been dripping or your toilet could have been leaking for six, seven weeks before you even know it. So this is a really great way to catch those leaks fast so that you can fix them or, you know, shut the valve off until you can fix it and save yourself some money and save yourself possibly some costly damage. Um, you can kind of go in and compare yourself to your neighbors that have the similar size household or a similar size because there is a comparison in there, um, similar size property. So then I just put the website up there if you're interested, but you can get all of this information off of our webpage too. Okay, um, another new project we've started is this um, replacing meters. So we have a lot of meters that are at the end of their battery life. And um, so what happens is it still records, the meters still record, but the battery isn't sending it to, um, when we go by and read, it isn't sending it to the transponder, the transponder isn't sending it to the computer. So then people, have bills average for a while for two three months and then all of a sudden they get we get caught up because we go out and do a hand read and then they've got a, a bigger bill because they weren't expecting it because it was averaged for a while so we realized that these meters were failing so we started this advanced meter infrastructure ami for short and what it does so that the savings that i was or the use that i was showing you in the last slide that's an older meter that's how the use shows up on the AMI meters. It shows up like this. So you can see the blue is the normal use down here and the red tells them they have a leak alert. So this person used, and I can't read that because these are too small, but this person used this much of their normal use, but then they have this leak on top of it. Another really great way to find out, and this is even faster finding this out with these meters. Um, so then you can check and see what your appliances, you know, you may be thinking about putting in a new dishwasher. Well, you can get on there and run your dishwasher and check and see how many gallons it uses. If it only uses three or four gallons, which is what the new ones use, maybe you can get by with that one if it's not broken. But you can check your toilets too. Toilets, washing machines, all of that, and have a better idea of what uses water. And honestly, the indoor piece, you know, fixtures and appliances have gotten a lot more efficient so that our indoor use is pretty good. Like I said, it's 45 gallons per person per day. On average, we find that people use about 44. So we set it at 45. Um, really, the big water use is outdoor. Okay. So this is the program I really wanted to talk to you about tonight is my Life After Lawn program. So this is a turf replacement program. You've heard them called um, cash for grass, things like that. Last year, the state passed a law and they're allocating $2 million towards um, utilities or cities like Greeley that already have a program or to jumpstart um, smaller utilities or cities that don't have a program. And they're giving us extra money to do some of these turf replacement programs. So this is an example right here. These folks took out all of this grass and replaced it with a nice planting bed and a little rock border. And you can't really see it, but back here, they took from this, this is the walkway up to their house. They created a pathway to go around this way to their backyard. So that's the kind of stuff people are doing. And, um, 
it can be a combination of you know shrubs perennials trees it still has to comply with city code and be 50 percent live plantings um and you can include this mature tree in that 50 percent you can see it has a nice big canopy here and get paid a dollar a square foot to replace grass with a more sustainable hopefully more drought tolerant landscape um, i have the program for both homeowners and large properties like um, churches Tanis, I saw you were on here. You did it a few years ago. She took, did her front yard. And then um, we're working on several HOAs. HOAs in churches are probably the most um, of what I have in the larger properties. I've done a couple commercial, but it's mostly HOAs and churches, which makes sense, you know. Um, in 2022, he uh, did over 120,000 square feet of turf replacement. And actually 120,000 is what we paid out to customers. It was actually more because there's, um, homeowners can do 500 square feet. And last year it was up to 2000. And I had some people that went over 2000. So they had replaced the turf. They just didn't get paid for it. And I also had a couple large properties that went over last year was 5,000 to 20,000 for the larger properties. This year we've extended it to 3,000 3, for homeowners and 30,000 for the large properties. So hopefully more folks will get um, paid for their contribution to the program. So this is really um, a great program. And, you know, a 500 square foot replacement probably isn't a ton of money or a ton of water savings, but when you put them all together, it adds up. And it's very satisfying for the homeowner to know that they've done this, they've been successful at their project, they en enjoy their yard, hopefully even more if they left any grass at all. I've had several people say, now that the grass is manageable size, it actually looks the best it's ever looked. So there's lots of benefits. And oh, I should mention that this, this is for front yards on the homeowners only thus far, but we're hoping to expand it to backyards soon. Um, these are some of the other things we've been a part of. We did the turf conversion at Woodbriar Park, the one at Bittersweet. We're now starting to do medians, rights away and roundabouts with um, native grasses or more sustainable um, landscaping alternatives. The, probably the cheapest thing to do is to convert like these large areas like this to, um, to the native turf because it's, you can almost pay for your project depending on how much you contract out. So I put this map up here. I just thought I'd mention that this is the part that remained bluegrass. And then all of this was done in native grasses. And then this outline in the red here is the part that was put back to bluegrass around the memorials. Probably didn't have to go all the way down here to the dam, but because of the way the um, irrigation was designed, they just decided to go ahead and go down to here because they would have had to split it in the middle of a zone. Do you want me to um, take any questions? Yeah. And how am I doing on time? Oh, you're you're doing oh, fine. Yeah. There's a there is one question in the chat. Uh, okay. And anybody who has questions, please go ahead and put those in the chat so we can get to those. Uh, there's a question about the life after lawn. Does a homeowner receive recurring dollars? Per square foot or just it's a one time only rebate? It's a one time check for that year. But but like I said, um, if we do start to do backyards, what we would do is we would let people who have participated in the front yard then do their backyard. So then they could also get it for that piece. And with the HOAs and some of the churches that have huge properties, um, probably more the HOAs than the churches, but I am advising them 
to phase their project over several years. Don't try and do more than you can in one year. You know, you could do several smaller projects and just design your property <laughs> and then prioritize the areas you want to convert first. So in that case, but for the square footage, yes, it'd be one time for this square footage and one time for this square footage. Okay. Did that make that sense for them? clarifies it. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sure. Anything else? Well, let's see. Not and a, I'm happy not to right take now. any other conservation questions too. But those were the newest programs, I'd say. Okay. I mean, we all know about checking your toilets for leaks and turning the water off when you brush your teeth. So I just wanted to highlight some of the the other programs. Okay, I'll go on if there's no okay. more. All right. So I told you about Boyd and Bellevue. This is this lower picture here is an upgrade we did to our Bellevue treatment plant at this brand new building. It's really nice. Here's kind of a, it's not really an aerial, more of an oblique photo of where it's located, but it is right in the foothills of um, the Rockies. So this is our original plant built in 1907. The water quality on this side is um, very high and we use this as our 365 day a year plant. And I already mentioned that it comes to Greeley by gravity. Um, it has the highest water quality because there's not much up above the plant. I mean, there's a few small towns, but it's really easy to treat. It's really easy to get to the filter plant. And um, we have six high mountain reservoirs on the Poudre side that we take water from and bring to Bellevue. The Boyd Lake, Lake plant, uh, I already told you it was built in the 60s. It's our peaking plant. The water quality over here um, is not as good. It's further out on the plains. There are shallower lakes. The one, the lakes on this side, Boyd, uh, Lake Loveland, Horseshoe, they're shallower lakes. So that means that um, we get those algae blooms. I'm sure you've noticed those in the late summer and fall where the water just kind of tastes musty or dirty. It's, mm -hmm. not, um, it's not the algae that is dangerous, but it does have a little bit of a weird taste. Um, the water out here because of the chemical makeup of the rocks is a little bit harder. And there is um, a little bit more urban runoff from houses, but also there are a couple farms in that area too. So this, this water is a little bit harder to treat. We use a, large, a lot of um, activated carbon in the treatment and they have done a lot of upgrades in the last couple of years to minimize some of the harder hardness of the water, but then also that um, taste and that odor from algae. So I do have a little demo here of the treatment. This is what our basins look like. This is at our Boyd Lake plant. Because it only runs during the summer, these basins are all outside. Whereas at Bellevue, they're all enclosed in a building because they have to function in the winter too. So this is the process. We take water in and um, we add alum to it. And this is a national little thing. So um, we don't add lime because our water is alkaline enough, but back east, they may have to add lime to it. So we mix the alum in and it's a real slow mixing. We just want to get the dirt particles and the alum to clump together. And then it goes into a settling basin. And um, so these are the slow mixers and then we really slow it down and all the sediment sinks to the bottom. Then we pull the clean water off the top and we take it into um, our filters, which are many layers of sand, garnet sand and that activated charcoal. And the water goes through those and that gets out any teeny tiny last particles. And then it goes into a tank where we add chlorine and we do also add fluoride. I know a lot of people are anti-fluoride, but we do add fluoride because we feel like the benefits 
for the dental health outweigh the negatives. So we do add, you know, just the right amount of fluoride and then it goes into treated storage. And so a treated storage tank may be um, like out at 23rd, an in-ground tank in the, in the underground, or it might be in a water tank like this and like we have out on Highway 34. So then the water's treated, how does it get to Greeley? These are those guys way back when in the early 1900s with that wooden stave pipe. And like I told you before, it started to leak a little bit or probably more than a little bit. So then in about the 40s and 50s, they started coating it with, um, they encased it in concrete in some places or they coated it with a, like a creosote type glue um, type thing. I don't even know technically what it was, but um, you know, that was to help with the leaking. And then um, pretty much now everything has been replaced with duct, it was then it was ductile steel. And then now it's this, um, some kind of a hard plastic. And this is a picture of our 60 inch transmission line that comes from Bellevue to Greeley now. It's not completely built, but we've been working on it for several years because right away for um, a pipe that big and that far, we needed to pursue that while we uh, still could get the right of way for it. So that'll be in, in place at some point. Um, so the, the lines that come from the plant are called transmission lines. All the pipes in town are called the distribution lines. So distribution and transmission, I'm sure you've heard those terms. Um, they're kind of interchangeable, but kind of not. Distribution is in town. And these are water mains and things like that. This is just a bunch of pictures of crews working on them. Right here, you can see what happens when you get a hole in the pipe. And then um, we sometimes have that when we have these freeze thaw cycles, we'll get more breaks in the pipe. We do have um, an active leak detection program so that we check those pipes so that we can plan, oh, we've got a little leak here, let's work with public works and only tear the road up once and get in there and fix it, that kind of a thing. We are pretty proactive on that. Um, these are wastewater collection trucks and that they might be either repairing or sending a camera down them to see if there's a clog, see if there's holes. And I have a little video coming up that I can show you that's kind of cool. So that's our video truck. And then this is kind of how this works. They'll send the, um, they'll open the lid and they'll send the camera down. So this would be, these orange things would be like manholes. And then it travels through the pipe and then pictures like that pop up on the camera. So these are, this is on the wastewater side after we've used the water. And you can see some root intrusion. You can see cracks in there. Here's a crack right in here. And um, really informs decisions on, do we need to get in there and fix this right away? And I just realized I was probably using my cursor on the wrong screen here. So when I was <laughs> pointing to things, you're probably going, what are you talking about? <laughs> and we collect the the wastewater, then it goes to our plant. This is over here, sorry, my dog's barking. This is over here, this is 85, Highway 85, and this is 8th Street. I'm sure you all know where that is. Mm -hmm. And that is our wastewater pollution facility. Um, there's just some facts about that. And I think that is the last slide. All right. Well, we do have several questions in the chat. Um, okay. What about the increase in population and building in the city of Greeley? Because we see building going on everywhere and countless apartments. And how does the city plan for that increase in population? Well, we have, 
we do plan, we feel like these guys in the, on the slide here handed us a legacy. And so we plan out into the future, 2050, 2060, in anticipation of you know, what's gonna happen in those years. Of course, the dog starts barking when you get on the phone or on the Zoom, right? Um, so we do have a huge planning horizon. No, stop it. We do have a huge planning horizon and try to anticipate things. Of course, you can't anticipate everything. But Greeley is pretty well set on water. And, um, you know, I told you we have the water in the four river basins. Mm -hmm. That is on purpose. We want that um, redundancy in our system. So just for example, one year uh, an asphalt truck fell in the Poudre River. And we couldn't take water out of the Poudre River during that time. So we switched over to the Big Thompson side and went to Boyd while that got cleaned up. You know what the forest fires have done to our system. You know, when the ash is coming down, it's turning the water black, it gives it another smoky flavor. Um, so we have to anticipate that, treat for that, or we switch over to the other side. It really has been pretty progressive in that. And I would say, that we really do have a legacy in our water system and it's something to be proud of. Absolutely, because this was called the Great American Desert at one point and uninhabitable. And here we, we are habitating this area, but with the drought and the continuing climate change, does the city look forward into those issues as well? Yes, we just redid our drought plan in 2019. And we, um, you know, in 2002, my only tool for the drought was to hire 10 water cops to go out and patrol. Now I have that AMI, so I can see if someone's watering in the middle of the night or watering, you know, if we tell them you can only water two days a week. We'll be able to tell if they're watering in the middle of the night or more than two days a week. Um, so we have that tool. We have the water budget to keep them in check. Mm -hmm. We have, and the, the new drought plan takes into account those things. So we would ratchet down. We don't ever want to ratchet down people's indoor water because that's kind of your lifeline water. Absolutely. But we would um, make the outdoor budget smaller so that we would have to conserve or pay, you know, that's fine if you want to water, but you're going to pay more for it. Um, and I don't know if I really actually answered the other question about growth for um, the first gal or the first person that asked that, but we're a water utility and we can't really control the growth. That would be city council and that, and that group of governing folks and community development but we have to be able to supply water no matter what happens. And I, I think we're gonna see more growth because Greeley is one of the few places where it's affordable to live. Exactly, so in other words, they, they, there are plans for growth and, and in case of a severe drought, uh, and who knows what's gonna happen in the future because I know at one point you told me that we get 40% of our water from the Colorado River. And we hear all the time about the Colorado River and how dire that is. How does that affect us? Well, um, it does affect us. But again, in that drought of 2022, I remember people saying, well, we're going to have water from the Colorado Big Thompson project because they're going to give us this bigger quota because it's a drought supply. And I was like going, but if there's no water in the lake, how can they give you a bigger quota? Because every year they declare what the quota is. And so you may have 10 shares, but if they declare a 70% quota, you can only use seven of those shares. And typically it's higher in a drought year because that's people's drought reserve. But um, I think the way that gets managed is gonna probably have to change a little bit. I think at some point they may look at Colorado water laws and revise those a little bit. I don't know. 
I mean, yeah, it's, but thank goodness Greeley has this redundancy built into our system. And Cameron Pass is doing well this year. Yeah, that's but, good. <laughs> but you're going to start hearing, I know last year Centennial had watering restrictions and I know Aurora, I mean, we always have watering restrictions. So I want to clarify the difference between everyday restrictions and drought restrictions. But Aurora has already declared that they're going to be on drought restrictions this year. And I've, uh, one of the things that I don't, I'm asking some questions and, and everybody else can jump in too and ask questions. Uh, if you don't want to put it in this uh, chat, you can do that. Um, when we talk about plants, what, how do we find out what plants we should plant in our yards to be efficient for water? Where, where do we find that resource? Well, we have a resource. We have an online plant database on our webpage, and I made it an easy URL to remember, plantsforgreely.com. Um, and we are revamping that currently, and this uh, new plant database is going to have even more plants. Um, other good sources are the Plant Select Program, and I have um, the executive director from Plant Select. He's going to come and do a uh, one of my landscape lectures for me, and he's going to address water conserving plants specifically. Not all of them in Plant Select are low water, but he's going to do the talk on that. Um, the natives are always a good bet. We have a really great Colorado Native Plant Society. They have a website with photos and descriptions, and they do a plant sale every year. That's another great resource. I can give you resources forever. Um, I try to encourage people to do local, but um, High Country Gardens out of Santa Fe, New Mexico, they have a great catalog and a great website, and that's a good place to go and do research on low water plants as well. But if you're shopping locally, which I encourage everyone to do, go to your local nurseries that are, um, they're gonna have the knowledgeable staff to inform you, this is a good plant. No, that's a water hog, that kind of thing, as opposed to, you know, the big box stores. Right. I have another question in the chat. It says, uh, this person asked, does wild li wildlife along the mountain headwater areas present much of a challenge? In other words, letting them have water without letting them getting into our water supply. I don't know that I can answer that, but I do know that not just Greeley, but there are other organizations out there. Like we have a program in place with all of the other water users on the Pooter, and I'm sure we probably have it on some of the other rivers where like in the winter when the uh, flow is very low, where we keep, and we did this with like Trout Unlimited and some of those organizations where we keep, we do releases from our reservoirs in the winter to keep the fish alive in the river, things like that. There's a lot of um, collaboration and cooperation amongst, and you know, for Collins and Greeley, we collaborate and co cooperate a lot because we're in the pooter together. You know, we own a lot of the same water rights and, um, it, it just makes good sense to pool your resources and do the best that you can for your city, your people, and your wildlife. Okay, yeah, we have a message in there too that Happy Life Gardens in Evans is very helpful too. And Evans gets really water, doesn't it? Um, Does they, we treat and deliver their water, but they own the water. Okay. So they buy the water, they turn it over to us, we treat it and deliver it and give it back to them. There's a misnomer there or misconception there that Evans is using our water, but it's technically their water. Um, another question or another comment here is, 
I admire your enthusiasm for these topics and how did you get into this career? Wow. Um, <laughs> so I came up to school at UNC and I came up here, quite frankly, because my sister was up here. And um, so she was going to school here. And so I wanted to be with her because she's my sister. She's my best friend. My parents bought a house up here for her to live in and her roommates in college. And so I could easily just move in with them. And I got my degree at UNC in biology and I emphasized in environmental studies. Um, and then um, for a while, I didn't use my degree and I was doing things like waiting tables. And then I got a job managing a garden center and I you know, got even more into the plant part of it. And really that's my passion is, you know, the landscaping. Mm -hmm. um, and then the garden center closed, garden center slash greenhouse closed. And I had about three months where I didn't have a job. So I was just kind of doing some odd jobs. And then a friend of mine called me and said, hey, there's this ad in the Tribune for a water conservation person for the city of Greeley. And I was going to apply for it, but I thought you'd be better for it. So I kind of just stumbled into that, applied <laughs> for the job and got it. Wow. It when? Was, when? We're very glad you did. <laughs> it was really fun because there was, it was edu there was some educational components and um, my boss at the time had written a conservation plan. So she handed it to me and said, here's your, here's your plan, do it. But I really had a lot of freedom and got to develop the program the way, you know, seeing the different trends and seeing what people responded to. And it was, it was pretty fun. <laughs> Another question. Uh, a person asks, uh, mentioned that they took a tour where they saw the sites that you showed us on the slides and it was very informative. Are you giving tours again of those water facilities? Yeah, and we kind of started that when we celebrated our 100 year um, in 2007. We started doing tours and that was really eye-opening for me because I did a little survey at the end and somebody said, wow, this was amazing. I will never complain about my water bill again. I had no idea. I mean, we're stretched from clear up Cameron Pass all the way down here. We cover a big area and we have a very extensive system and a diverse system and um, that's how that whole thing started. And I was like, we got to keep these tours going. So now they do a board tour where um, board members will be on the tour with you. So you can ask all questions. Our board, our water board, we've been all for a long time. Harold Evans has probably been on the water board for over 30 years. Oh my. So they really know the system. So yes, watch for that. It's usually June, July. They'll put something in the paper. And can and, that and information the other, be found on the website as well? Yes, it should be, yes. And the other tour you should consider doing is um, Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District that manages the CBT system. They do tours every summer too. They do two of the East Slope and two of the West Slope. So I would um, call over there and get on their list too because they do fill up. And that's, you know, that's another piece of what goes into our system. So it's really, it's good to go see that too. In fact, we always make new employees go on those tours too. <laughs> oh, I'm not, uh, there is another question. Could you repeat that? I'm not sure what he means by that. Uh, maybe they'll put something else. Yeah. And Northern, that conservancy district that I kept, oh. I've mentioned a couple times, they go by Northern Water now. They're just like northernwater.org, I think. Okay. On the and that's where, that's where you can find information about those tours as well. About the CBT. Yeah. The tour for our system. And a lot of times they go and look at the current construction projects. That would be on Greeley's webpage. Another question. 
Has the city code enforcement changed policies from 2008 when their rules penalized people for removing lawn and having alternative plantings? And I don't know whether that means weeds or something because I've noticed that in, even in my neighborhood, there are a lot of people that just have stopped watering their lawns completely and there's weeds. Well, that's why I really want to endorse the Life After Lawn program because we want to control it so that it's an attractive landscape for the homeowner, the neighbors, the whole neighborhood, and people can take pride in um, their neighborhood. Now, I don't know that they ever, I mean, if you had no lawn there, yes, they would probably cite you for that. People misinterpreted that 50% live plantings as at least 50, and it used to be 75. People interpreted that as 75% or 50% grass. It's never said that. It's always said live plantings. So I don't think they would have penalized you for that. Okay. If it was weeds, yes, they're going to get after you for weeds. But the other thing is with these native grasses, they grow taller. So we did get them to amend that the grass could be kept taller because you want your native grasses to be tall through the, I've got a cat screaming at me. Um, you want the native grasses tall through the heat of the summer because if you cut them off like people do with bluegrass and you shouldn't even sh cut bluegrass that short, um, you just encourage more weeds because the grass kind of shades the soil and the minute you open that up, then those weeds that like the sun are going to start sprouting. Right. So they do allow for native grasses now. I guess that was a long way of getting to that. Sorry. Okay. I'm being long-winded. Oh, well, the questions keep coming. Uh, this is one, do the types of trees and plants change over time as our climate becomes drier? particularly with trees and the importance of their canopies to keep their surrounding environment cooler. How do we find out what are the best for this area, especially since pests are coming in that degrade certain trees? Yeah, our city forestry department is the best way. He has um, a little business card size and he's got ornamental trees on one side and uh, shade trees on the other side. And those are the trees that he recommends for our area because yeah, you cannot grow a maple here. It doesn't like the soil. It doesn't like the dryness. So um, aspens shouldn't be planted down on the prairie. And really our only native tree to this area is a cottonwood, yeah. but the cottonwood isn't gonna grow in an area that's not getting irrigated. It's gonna grow along the little sw uh, swales and ravines and places where the water's gonna gather. You only see those cottonwoods in nature right along the, the creek beds. Exactly. But forestry, they've got a great resource and they have that uh, Share the Shade program where you can get trees. Um, and that's one thing we really do wanna make sure we do is protect that urban canopy. Yeah, that's so important because our are there trees that take less water than others? Yeah, there are. And that plant database, um, we have the new one that's coming out, we're going to have in there. The one currently are pretty much all low water, but the ones that we're going to have coming out that has even more plants in it, we've um, put them into hydrozones. So low, medium, high, or very low hydro zones. So people will know when they go in there. And that doesn't mean it can't take a little more water, but if it can survive on less water, we're gonna put it in the lower hydro zone. So oh. I think that'll help folks too. Yeah, there's a lot of information that we need to know to for water conservation and for our own well being as well. And as you said, I think we mostly know what to do in our homes to keep the water usage low, but uh, there's always something to learn. Oh, here's- Well, and new people to Colorado. They come from well, the Midwest and 
you know, you just put something in the ground and it grows. Yes, and it's certainly not like that. Uh, here's another comment. I'm surprised you said we should plant aspen. I have never had luck with aspen doing well here on the prairie. I said don't plant aspen. Oh, don't. Okay. I said the aspen trees in the mountains do not plant them down here. Right, right. Sorry if okay. I didn't make that clear. I hope that clears that up. Yeah. Does it, anyone else have any other questions? Being no more questions, I would again like to thank you, Ruth Quaid, for doing this for us. A lot of good information here, a lot to learn about our water system, where it comes from, how we use it, and how best to use it, and how to conserve, and also where we can find those resources. Uh, we need to learn more. Thank you so very much for joining the League for this event. Uh, and with that, We'll conclude our program tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want me to go ahead and leave or do you? Yeah, yeah I think okay. we're, we're, thank you so much. This is great.